uh, to see what our thoughts are for the vision of our faith community. And there's a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center for those of you who would like to host one of those visioning meetings at your home. Are there any other announcements, uh, joys, or concerns? Yes. My adoptive mother is going to have surgery. She's got nodules on her brain. Mm -hmm. So if we could all pray for her. Her yes. name is uh, Lavon. Lavon? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you. Any yes, Julie. No, you can come up if you want. Well, I think I've got a loud enough voice. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. I hear you. Well, I just wanted to say that the Mission and Outreach uh, Board has been working on some things, uh, trying to find different ways that we can help in the community. And one of the ways is, you know, the Siouxland Soup Kitchen. The Siouxland Soup Kitchen is a, just a lifeline for people. It's a lifeline for people who just need a warm meal. And so uh, we have a member, Milton Davis, you mentioned earlier, who organized for years, organized teams of volunteers to help out, to help serve food or to help prepare food. And since she's not able to do that anymore, we, the Mission and Outreach Board kind of got back on track and we uh, have scheduled a time that we are going to make fun, going to have a team to help out. And our time is scheduled for Tuesday, February 8th, from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, and we're going to serve meals that night. So we hope that we can get, we need five volunteers, so we already have two, so we need a couple more people to help us out to do that. Um, another, and so just talk with me, or talk with Pat, or Jesse, one of us, if you can help out, and we'll kind of arrange a time to talk about it. <coughs> Uh, another thing we noticed is at the soup kitchen, they not only provide meals, but they also know that people need other things just to survive. They need clothing, they need toiletries, they need other things to survive. And one of the things they need right now, for obvious reasons, is blankets. And there are a lot of people who are homeless or, you know, just who need a blanket. And it's so cold, I thought that would be kind of a neat thing for Mayflower to collect our blankets. Now, what I encourage you to do is to go home and dig through your closet. See if you have an extra blanket that maybe you aren't using, that maybe you could uh, part with. And it doesn't have to be in perfect shape, but it needs to be gently used if possible. And we're going to have a sign in the West Parlor. And we're going to collect blankets for the soup kitchen. And people think that they only provide meals, but they do provide other, these other services. And they call it Eric's Closet. And it's a, it's a storage room where they keep a lot of items that people need. And it's named after a homeless man who uh, was very generous with what little he had. So if you can part with a blanket and can bring to church within the next month or so, We'd like to deliver these, you know, before it gets too late because it's so cold right now. So maybe down, like by Valentine's Day, that would be great. So we'll have a place in the corner where you can donate these. All right. Well, there's a uh, location for those that may not of the soup kitchen. Oh, it's, the soup kitchen is located uh, just West off 7th. West 7th Street. Mm -hmm. If you go on Hamilton to West 7th Street and just turn, like, to go downtown, it's just like a block or two in there. So it's not too far from here, so it'd be a you know an easy an easy place for people to to help out, and it'll be a neat way to start the year 2022. Mm -hmm. So let me know if you can help us out. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other announcements, joys, or concerns? Yes, Conrad. Just to add on to what she just said, as you're driving towards it, it's on the north side of the street. Unfortunately, I don't at the moment know the exact address, yeah. but remember that it's on the north side of the street, about a block or two east from Hamilton, should help you to find it. There's one more announcement I forgot about. Uh, our new pub theology group is meeting at Far Louie at 4 p.m. Uh, if you need a location for that, I can tell you that I'll get it on my phone after the service. 
And we will be finishing up uh, my former professor of seminary, uh, Dr. Carter, his book, Healing Our Racial Divides. Any other announcements, joys, or concerns? Okay. And we will continue with the passing of the peace. Now, our tradition at Mayflower is that we pass the peace in several different ways. You can turn to your neighbor and wave and offer your peace of the price through waving. And then we have one side of the aisle pass the peace to the other. Um, so let's have this side turn to the left side and they can say, may God's peace be with you. And then this side will respond and also with you. May God's peace be with you. And also, also with you. Amen. And for those joining us online, you can also offer us the peace of Christ in the chat. And let us know where you are watching us from here in Sioux City. And we will continue with baptism. This morning is Baptism of the Lord Sunday, the time where we remember our own baptisms, and I wanted to offer you this reflection about the meaning of baptism. Water is one of the most ancient symbols of our faith. It was water that the Israelites came through into freedom. It was water that Jesus was baptized in. It was water by which he called the disciples. It was water that he used to teach his disciples how to be servants to all. Today we take a journey of our own discipleship through water and spirit. We let go of all things we do not need. We remember our belovedness. We recommit to serve others with joy. So let us now go down to the river to pray. This was donated to Mayflower Congregational Church by the Roseland Hill Congregational Sunday School. It was a congregational church in Hartford, Connecticut in January of 1894. And this is what we have used for baptism ever since. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that in every age you have made water a sign of your presence. In the beginning, your spirit brooded over the waters, and they became the source of all creation. You led your people Israel through the waters of the Red Sea to their new land of freedom and hope. In the waters of the Jordan, your son was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit for his ministry. May the same spirit bless the water we use today, that it may be a fountain of a new creation. This is the water through which we experience the healing and wholeness, promising us that a time will come when all is good, Come, Spirit, come and be a new reality. Renew us as we acknowledge that you are the victory, you are the grace, and you are the reason this gathering is a holy place. Come, Spirit, renew the hearts of all gathered for praise and prayer. Renew in us the desire for justice and peace liberation and life, now and every day. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Please join me in the invocation. Call worship. Yes. In the beginning, water cradled us in the womb, holding us in suspension until we burst forth in the waters of birth. In the desert, a small drop of water causes life to bloom. A tiny drop of water can quench our burning thirst for justice. And love flows through the water. In the roots of our being, water provides sustenance. Without water, our lives would shrivel and wither. As love flows through the water. In the times when we feel sullied and broken, we long to be reawakened by soaking in forgiving, transforming love. As love flows through water. All water is holy, a sign that we have passed through troubles, that we have been refreshed by a gift of life, sustained by a love poured over us. As love flows through water. In the aftermath of water, is the rainbow sign of God's continuing love at work within us and through us. God loves us. God's love also flows through the singing. God loves to hear our voices. And we will join together in many of the light
in God's image. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. This is the good news. I have God. And now I would like to invite the children to come forward and have seats uh, down here in these pews. This morning, I want to begin our time together by showing you something I'm sure you've seen before. You see it here in the sanctuary every Sunday when we come to church. We only use it once in a while, though. Can you guess what that is, Anaya? Here's a clue. It has water in it. Yeah, that thing right there. Good. Oh, precious. That's right. It's the thing we use for baptism. It's called a baptismal font. Have, have you ever seen a baptism here at church before? Do you remember what happened? Uh, a kid got baptized, a baby got baptized, I think. Okay, a kid got baptized. So when a baptism happens, the minister asks the people, the person, whether it's an adult or a child being baptized, whether or not they love Jesus and want to follow Jesus' teaching. If it's a baby or a small child is being baptized, the minister will ask, if it's a small child, the minister will ask the parents about their commitment to Jesus. After the person or parents answer yes, the pastor dips their hand in the water and the pastor puts their wet hand on the baby's head and says that they baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you remember your baptism? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you haven't been baptized yet. The. <laughs> <laughs> well, you will have the experience probably of remembering it. I remember my baptism. It was at Crowder State Park in Trenton, Missouri when I was 15. Now, if, now, if you happen to be a person that was younger and you didn't remember your baptism, you can ask your mom or dad about that experience and what they remembered about that day when you were a child and you came to church and were baptized by the minister for the first time. Jesus was baptized when he was 30. His cousin John was preaching and baptizing people at the Jordan River. And Jesus went to the river to be baptized by his cousin John. Now when John saw Jesus coming to be baptized, he was very surprised. This was God's chosen one, the special person God had sent into the world to teach people about God's love. John did not think he was good enough to baptize Jesus. He said, I should not baptize you, you should baptize me instead. But Jesus told John that God wanted him to be baptized, so John agreed to go ahead and baptize him. John and Jesus walked into the Jordan River. When John baptized people, they got really wet. This is a river outside, similar to the state park I got baptized in. It was like a mossy lake. So there at the Jordan River, John baptized Jesus. The Bible tells us that when Jesus came out of the water, the heavens opened up. So when they use the word heavens, that's like the sky. 
So the sky opens up, and the Spirit of God comes down from the sky like a dove. Have you ever seen a dove before? And this dove, God's voice comes down and says to Jesus, You are my dear Son, with whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine, can you imagine what that would be like for the sky to split in two and a dove to come down? No, it's, it's hard to imagine. At that moment, both John and Jesus knew that they had done the right thing. God was happy with Jesus being baptized. For three years after his baptism, Jesus went on to teach and preach and heal people. He had 12 close friends that were called disciples who helped him with his work. One of the last things Jesus told his disciples was to go out into the world and preach the good news about Jesus and God's love. When people believed what the disciples told them and wanted to become Christians, Jesus told the disciples to baptize them, just as Jesus was baptized. Even today, people who love Jesus are baptized. People who want their children to grow up knowing Jesus as their friend have their babies baptized as well. Being baptized means we're part of a loving family, the family of God. And so today, we're remembering our baptism or we're affirming our baptism. And people are going to come up to that font over there, dip their hand in it, and say that they're God's beloved. Do you want to go look at the font or dip your hand in it? Kind of cool, isn't it? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending your child Jesus into the world to show us your love and how you want us to live. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now I have some candy here, if it's all right with your parents and your grandmother. Would you like some candy? Yeah, I know. No problem. Continuing with our new message series, where we will be, where we're exploring who will who we are as a congregation moving into the new year. And today is baptism of the Lord Sunday, where we remember our baptism and we reflect upon the meaning of baptism. Our scripture text is the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist according to 
Matthew's Gospel. Every year we hear this classic story on the first Sunday after Epiphany. Let us hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of Christ. Do you remember your baptism? I know that the United Church of Christ is a diverse denomination, and some of us may have come from various traditions that may have baptized differently than we do at this church. So there may be some who remember their baptisms and some who may not have. If you do not remember your baptism, I'm sure that your parents at some point recounted to you the story of what it was like that day when the pastor held you in his arms and baptized you at the font. I was baptized as a teenager at Crowder State Park outside of Trenton, Missouri. And it was a lake that was common for all the young kids in the summertime to go swim at. And it was full of moss and all kinds of other nice things. <laughs> I had first made a connection with the church when I attended a youth group with my sister that was hosted by a couple that were friends of my parents. It was at a little storefront charismatic Pentecostal church in Trenton, Missouri called Cornerstone Fellowship. It was at this church that I first experienced affirmation and acceptance as a teenager. Being a teenager was not easy for me in the small community that I grew up in. There was not very many places where I experienced a loving community. There were a lot of times as a teenager when I felt alienation and rejection in the small town of Jamesport, Missouri, where I grew up. It was here that I first became aware, though, of a calling to be a pastor. Later on, as I got older, there would be many things that caused me to inevitably leave this community. However, this was my entry point into the Christian faith. And it was here in this environment where I first became aware of what would be my future vocation as a pastor. Jesus was baptized around the age of 30, the Gospels tell us. He would have come to see John at the Jordan River from his hometown of Nazareth. And after Jesus is baptized by John, he hears a voice from God affirming him as God's beloved Son with whom he is well pleased. When we are baptized into the church, we too are affirmed as God's beloved children. Why is an affirmation of our own identity such an important part of the baptismal ritual? There are many voices within our culture that try to tell us who we are or who we need to be. Self-help books tell us that if you just do X, Y, and Z, you can shortly find your way to being a better, more fulfilled you. You just need to buy the book at your nearest Barnes & Noble for $9.95. Use this pill, buy this new iPhone or tablet, and you will be happier and more fulfilled as a human being. 
These kinds of marketing strategies that incorporate a sense of identity into their products are effective because many people don't feel like they belong or they are not sure who they are. So they need a form of affirmation that they are not getting from anywhere else. Recently, our Mayflower Pub Theology Group that meets at Bar Louie here in Sioux City has been finishing up the book by my former uh, professor that I had in seminary, Dr. Terrell Carter, called Healing Racial Divides. His book points out that we begin to form our sense of identity in high school. One of the examples he gives in his book is of how teenagers begin to do this in high school around a school cafeteria table. Teachers and retired teachers know what I'm talking about. With every different group sitting at their particular table, the jocks have one table, the nerds have another, the music enthusiasts have another, and the rebel smokers are in the back alley by the dumpster. <laughs> Dr. Diana Butler Bass, a historian of Christianity writes in her book, Christianity After Religion, that often in the past, when we have had new members join the church, we start with either belief or practice, but belonging has tended to come last. She writes that one of the big changes that is taking place today is that those joining the church today want to feel the belonging first. And then comes the belief, the practice. They want to have that sense of belonging to a community as their starting point. And then belief and practice flow from that. Recently on Netflix, I watched a series of makeover shows called Queer Eye, where the Fab Five come to a person's home and they help them improve their lives by fixing up their homes as well as giving them new clothes or outfit to help improve their self-esteem, their self-worth. On one particular series, the Fab Five crew goes to help out a middle-aged grandmother adjust from dressing and acting like a teenager wearing tight clothes as well as helping her with her house, which was a complete mess for things scattered all over the place, and she still liked the party. Her daughter had nominated her for this makeover because while she loved her mother, she felt that she needed some sort of intervention due to her not wanting to adjust to the fact that she is now an older person and a grandmother. She was still wanting to live the life of a younger person. And this was why she wore provocative clothing, and her house was such a mess. The Fab Five came into her home and helped her to see that she could still be an attractive person as a grandmother with more suitable clothes for her age, and could still have fun even though she was older. They helped her to love herself for who she was at that particular point in her life. Because she did not love herself. She didn't want to be an older grandmother. She still wanted to be a teenager. She had to go through a process of accepting herself for who she was. An environment where an individual is not affirmed and free to be their true, authentic, God-created self is a toxic environment. Another series I watched on Netflix that I had heard about, but I really couldn't bear myself to watch it, was a documentary that was uh, documenting um, this group of people that had been a part of the ex-gay movement, and it was called Pray Away. And during the source, I eventually said, okay, I'm going to sit down and watch through this. I sat through horror movies before. <laughs> so I sat down, and basically, it was this group of people, they wanted to belong. And so their sense of belonging was, you have to get married, you have to have a wife, 
want to be a church leader. And so they went through that life. They were a part of promoting it as therapy and whatever. And But later, they eventually came to the point in their life where this was not who they were. They were still acting the way they didn't want to be. And it wasn't until the end when these groups, one of them was called Exodus, the leaders finally said, we were wrong. This doesn't work. And the psychologists have said all along that it's toxic, it doesn't work, they've always prohibited it. Unfortunately, a lot of our faith communities still practice it, even though there's been some efforts to ban it. And so they came to that point where they had to do a complete 180 and go back and live the life that they were always meant to live. But they also had to go back and recognize all of the people who they damaged in the process of living a lie. Baptism is our own kind of makeover as Christians who are being initiated into this community of Christ. In the early church, baptisms took place in baptismal pools where the one who was to be baptized would remove their clothes that they had brought with them as they went into the waters of baptism. Now, women and men were baptized separ separately in different baptismal pools, for modesty, of course. And a lot of the early Christian deaconesses, who were women, would baptize the women, and then uh, deacon men would baptize the men. They would face west and renounce all evil and everything that could prevent them from following Jesus. And then they would be immersed three times in the waters in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And after the baptism, they would be given new white garments and a lit candle symbolizing the light of Christ within them. Baptism is a time in which we get rid of things that prevent us from being our true, beloved self as children of God. And we begin incorporating new things into our lives to help us to be better followers of Jesus. I believe that baptism symbolizes an ongoing process and practice that we will always be working towards our entire lives. We will always be dying to something and being reborn into something new. The church has always had a practice of reaffirming our baptisms, which speaks to this continued ongoing process. This morning I would like to invite you to come to these water baptismal fonts. You will see on the mirror is a message saying the same thing that God said to Jesus, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You can dip your hand into the water, make the sign of Christ on your forehead, say, I am God's beloved. If you want to mimic it, you can. But here's the, the point of all this, why the affirmation matters. The affirmation comes to us at our baptism the reason this is important, because when we are affirmed by God within a community of faith, we are then free to live out our vocation and calling to its fullest. Without that affirmation and acceptance, you can never live out your vocation and calling to its fullest, because you do not know who you are. Amen. And now, uh, just to kind of walk through what all we'll be doing, uh, when you come up, you can look in the mirror, if you want to dip your hand in water, put it on your forehead, or make the sign of the cross, say, I am God's beloved, or then again. But I also invite you, if there's anything that you need to get rid of in your life, to be transformed into that new person of Christ. That Christ has created us to be, that you can leave that here at the <coughs> baptismal font 
as we move into the new year. Now, as we come forward to participate in this reaffirmation of our baptism, I would ask people to go around the side aisle here and then come up this way and then move back down.
much. Oh God, may our hearts break for this broken world. May we be your healing and restoring hands. Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. Oh God, may our spirits sigh for those who wander, displaced from their homes by famine, fire, and war. May we be your voice to bid them welcome. Holy Spirit, Hear our prayer. O oh God, may our very beings tremble at your scattered family, torn asunder by hatred, racism, and bigotry. May we be your feet bringing the good news of justice and peace. Holy Spirit, hear our prayer. O oh God, you formed us and made us. We are your body, and we cannot do your work apart from each other. By the shaping of your Holy Spirit, make us into the people to whom you have already said, with you I am well pleased. Now let us say together the prayer that Jesus taught his early disciples in whatever version is comfortable for you, our Father.
When we give our tithes and offerings, we are witnesses to the transforming love of God in Christ. I invite you to give as generously as you have received. Now our deacons um, will be coming down the center aisles, and then they will loop around to the side aisles, and they are wearing uh, gloves and masks. Let us prepare for this morning's offering. Mm -hmm.
river, when you pass through the waters, that God will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flames shall not consume you. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.